On the eve of the new year in 2010, country music artist Brad Paisley tweeted, quote, Tomorrow is the first blank page of a 365-page book. Write a good one. Hi, I'm Zach, and I'm joined by my colleagues Craig and Pam. It's December 31st, New Year's Eve, and I don't know about you guys and our listeners, but I always spend the day reflecting on the passage of time from the past year. This year, for instance, we bought and renovated a house, and I ran a few half marathons, but I also spent too much time playing video games and might have eaten too much ice cream. Nevertheless, it's in that reflective spirit that the three of us have framed today's episode. We asked ourselves, which C-SPAN clip from the past year was most interesting or meaningful to you, and why? So join the three of us, the C-SPAN education team, as we look back on the year before we move forward into 2023. As Zach mentioned before the break, the end of each year serves as a time to reflect on one's lives, but it can also be a time for some of us to take the many positive things in one's life for granted. I know that I'm as guilty of that as much as anyone, and I've picked a clip to help me remember just how fortunate my family is, and it's one of deeply personal testimony from a recent congressional hearing with fair housing advocates testifying on access to affordable housing. In this clip, we have Margaret Ead, a former librarian from Virginia Beach, and she's detailing her and her husband's experience of losing their main source of income during the pandemic, to being evicted from their apartment, and that led to them living from their car off and on over the past two years. The visuals of the video clip are actually quite tough to watch as you see Margaret's very proud husband trying to be strong for the both of them and keeping it together as he sits in the row immediately behind her while she testifies, but he breaks when he hears his wife's voice start to quiver as she details their experience and the hurdles that they've found in their way as they seek to find a safe and permanent shelter for the two of them. Now, regardless of political party or ideologies, no one wants to see more homelessness in this country, but the ideas on how to best uh, address the issue at the federal level, they vary greatly among the many advocates and elected officials in Congress. Zach recently developed a deliberative lesson where students will learn more about the national statistics and the history of homelessness in the United States, as well as the very suggested approaches to address the issue at the federal level. We'll link that lesson on our featured resources page for you to review, but for now, let's listen to Margaret Ead's testimony. When the pandemic hit in 2020, my husband saw his hours cut in his job hauling trash to the landfill. We fell about $150 short on our rent. Instead of working with us, the landlord evicted us. My husband and I decided to move into our vehicle while we searched for other places. But soon we found out the barriers to finding a home were very steep. Whenever my husband and I would speak with rental offices, I would give them my name. They would type my name in some sort of data system and then tell me, we see an eviction on your public record and we cannot help you. My husband and I were able briefly to find a place to live after our story received news coverage. We received support from, my con from kind individuals on GoFundMe. But this year, after that attention faded, our landlord chose to do what many landlords have done recently. They, they failed to renew our lease after it expired. And they increased our apartment's rent beyond what we could pay. So for the last four months, my husband and I have been living in our car again. In the parking lots where we sleep and in homeless agency where we visit, I have met many other homeless family. It hurts so bad to see moms in there out there with their kids. Dads look like their pride was stolen away from them. And when they tell you their stories, they will tell you that they would turn the world upside down because it went, went up by even just 50 or 60 more dollars and they couldn't afford that. Even if an apartment were to be offered to us, the deposit and income requirements are so high, a landlord typically asks for three times the rent up front. 3,000, for example, for a place that rents 4,000. We don't have that. Landlord also, landlords can also require you to show that you make three times the monthly rent just to qualify. We can't show that. All of this make people in our situation more vulnerable, vulnerable to any landlord who will accept you, even if, the, even if they overcharge you and provide unsafe conditions. When people have stable housing, it allows them to do so much more in life. I know that it's hard for a member of Congress to imagine yourself living in your car. It was hard for my husband and I to imagine ourselves in this situation, but I'm asking you today to imagine yourself in our situation. 
You don't know how good it is to have a knob to turn every evening to enter a space where you're safe and not in danger until that, takes, that is taken away from you. There are so many, a lot of people out here that if they had safe, affordable housing, and if they could stay in it until the day they die, that would be something that really they really do desire. Anything that you can do to help make this a reality would make a lot of a lot to mean, mean a lot to people. Well, you all know that I'm a history lover, and for me, I value reflecting on our past, not just for the year, and not just as individuals, or even just as families, but as a nation. So for this episode, I reflected on a C-SPAN program I viewed this year that talked about the discovery of the Clotilda, a slave ship that carried 110 captives from Africa to the shores of Alabama in 1860, more than 50 years after the transatlantic slave trade was outlawed. I was intrigued. So how does this narrative fit into the history of the United States? Let's play a portion of a C-SPAN interview with journalist and author Ben Rains, who was instrumental in this discovery to provide context for this topic. Why were you successful? People have been searching for the Clotilda for a very long time. Why were you successful when others had not been? Well, you know, the big, the big thing was everybody was listening to the, the man who perpetrated the crime, Timothy Mayer, who was an Alabama steamboat captain uh, and one of the wealthiest people in Alabama in the 1800s. So he, um, he made a bet on the deck of his steamboat when a bunch of wealthy passengers were out drinking whiskey and smoking cigars one night in 1859. And he bet these Yankees that he could go to Africa and, and capture, you know, bring back uh, some enslaved people. So um, he did and was successful, but he had been bragging about the trip the whole time the ship he hired was sailing to Africa. You know, you've got to remember this was illegal in 1860. It had been illegal to import people from other countries as to enslave them since 1808. So this was a capital crime and he could have been hung for it. So he bragged about it so much that the federal government, federal agents were watching him and his house by the time the ship came back three months later. So they knew that they had to, uh, they had to go out and, and hide the ship when it came back and they decided to burn it. So he spent the next 30 years of his life after having gotten away with this, they burned the ship to hide the crime and you know it sank below the water. So he lied about where the ship was for the next 30 years. He gave the series of interviews over and over and over. Uh, and every time he said a different location, you know, Bayou Cannot, Bayou Corn, all these different bayous in this gigantic swamp that sits above Mobile. And I say gigantic, it's about 250,000 acres. Imagine a swamp that's 15 miles wide and 60 miles long. <laughs> and so he'd been lying about where the ship was in all these places. And everyone who had searched for it had listened to him in his interviews and gone and looked in the places he suggested, all of which were just to throw you off the trail. Um, and so I, I went and looked at the historical documents and found some other references where people who were there that night gave a different location. And they all gave the same location, 12 Mile Island. And that's ultimately where I found the ship. This real life story just struck me. I'd never heard about it. And I was left with so many questions, which is always what we aim for with our students, right? In the classroom, to spark an interest for them, to want to explore an idea or a topic, and to dig deeper to drive their own learning. So I continued listening to that program and ended up developing a lesson for teachers to use with their students. And the lesson includes clips that offer insight into the people who were involved in this act, how the slaves were taken from their hometown in Africa, the experiences they endured on board the Clotilda, how they were received once they reached the United States and established their own community of Africatown near Mobile, Alabama, their interactions with enslaved people already in this country, and what happened to the men involved with this operation. We've also included clips of programs that show archival images of the last known surviving Clotilda slaves, including Kajo Lewis and Radoshi, as well as featured descendants of the Clotilda from a reunion we covered, which offered powerful testimony of the generational impact this had on families. It also gave voice to those who were taken from Africa and offers a platform for descendants to share their vision for the future. Now, I continue to do research on this topic, and as a matter of fact, I purchased the book, Barracoon, by Zora Neale Hurston, which highlights interviews she did with Kudjo, which is a rich primary source. 
Well, now I guess it's my turn. Um, for me, my selection was a little bit more about the impact of the resource than the resource or the content itself. Pam and I had the opportunity to attend the National Council for the Social Studies or NCSS conference in Philadelphia about a month and a half ago. And along with networking with old friends and exploring a city that I hadn't yet been to, we spent time representing C-SPAN classroom in the exhibit hall. It was during this time that a high school teacher came to our table and discussed how her students loved one of the lesson plans that we had on the development of state constitutions during the early American Republic. Now, let me clarify. As we've mentioned multiple times throughout this podcast, the three of us are all former classroom teachers. So being removed from the day-to-day interaction with students, of which I experienced myself for seven years as a middle school teacher, I always wonder about how teachers and students are viewing and using the content that we're developing. The discussion with this teacher, which was similarly repeated with other teachers over the course of the conference weekend, proved as validation that, one, our resources can be used by teachers and students from all walks of life and all types of classes and at multiple grade levels, and two, our impact as educators always extends far beyond our own walls. Let's listen to a brief portion of the final clip from the lesson on early state constitutions in which Ohio State University professor Margaret Newell discusses key takeaways regarding state sovereignty during the early republic. So here's a couple takeaways. Uh, One is that uh, this idea of a Declaration of Rights, a Bill of Rights, is probably one of the most lasting and great contributions of this era of constitution writing. But also the idea that politics is a, you know, politics is a potentially moral activity. And the structure of government can be used to change things that you want for society. These are, these are, these are sort of lasting uh, contributions. And probably one of the greatest contributions of the American Revolution to su- subsequent revolutions. So it influenced the French Revolution, influenced the ha- Haitian Revolution, you know, any, any of these democratic revolutions. The Declaration of Rights became the basis of their own declarations of rights. The, the writing of constitutions, you know, even in the, after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, you know, former Soviet republics asked uh, you know, uh, Americans to come and help them write constitutions. But they sometimes wanted to put things in their list of rights like the right to housing or the right to health care. In the clip, you heard Professor Newell discussing the, quote, lasting contributions of the American Revolution and the development of early state constitutions. This small clip excerpt showcases what the teacher at the conference described as the lecturer's easy-to-understand delivery of the content. These clips, which are coupled with a Google Doc graphic organizer and pre-built questions for consideration and discussion, have already made an impact for hundreds of students across the country. And for us, for me, that is indeed meaningful, and we're thankful for each day that we can continue to help educators in their work teaching the next generation of our country's leaders. Well, a short episode, but we hope you enjoyed reflecting on the year with us, albeit with a little bit more C-SPAN flavor than you might be used to. But nevertheless, we wish you a fantastic new year, and we look forward to generating even more useful C-SPAN classroom resources for you and your students in 2023. As always, you'll find links to the resources that we highlighted in this episode and more on our featured resources page at www.cspan.org slash classroom. And if you'd ever like to connect with our team to learn more about what we have to offer for teachers and students, please email us anytime at educate at cspan.org. That's it for this week. Please remember to like and follow our podcast wherever you listen so you don't miss our next episode. Until then, thank you for joining us.